In section nine, we had a look at the luminosity function for stars. We've seen that stars pretty much like the sun were very common. Stars which are fainter than the sun are even more common and that stars which are very bright are very rare. The same thing goes actually for galaxies and we can look at a luminosity function for galaxies instead of stars. What we realized after a few years of doing these studies is that galaxies, they're very bright. You're looking at absolute magnitudes that obviously are much brighter than single stars because galaxies contain hundreds of billions of stars. Those galaxies are incredibly rare. There's galaxies pretty much like the Milky Way, they're very typical, but then galaxies which are even fainter actually dominate the number of galaxies in the universe. For galaxies, there is an actual very simple function that can describe the behavior of the luminosity function that is a combination of a power law for faint luminosities and an exponential decay for very bright luminosities. And the way that you obtain a luminosity function for galaxies is relatively simple. Essentially, for every single band of absolute magnitude, you count how many galaxies you find and also divide by the volume that you search those galaxies in. And this is how you would obtain data points within this curve. And then you can fit that curve with a Schechter function that we shall cover in detail. Mathematically, a Schechter function is really a combination of a power law, essentially something that's affecting luminosity with the power of alpha times an exponential to describe the exponential decay of the counts as you go to high luminosities. In practice, the Schechter function was proposed and it is still an incredibly good way to fit or model galaxy luminosity functions. You can write it essentially in two forms. And the reason why you can find this in the differential form is because the Schechter function is modeling the relative number density of galaxies for each bin or essentially range of luminosity. And that is why we indicate and we look at d phi dl, or if you want to write it in this form, phi times dl, and you get the dl to the other side. And you'll see that this function is also quite useful because it will allow us to integrate and actually calculate what is the total number of galaxies in the universe or the total mass that exists in galaxies or even the total star formation rate density in the universe. Apart from being a relatively simple multiplication of a power law and an exponential function, the Schechter function contains essentially three different parameters. One, which is this ratio of phi star and L star is basically something that will provide the normalization. And we'll see specific examples of how we do that. While this component L over L star over alpha is the power law component and E to the power of minus L over L star is the exponential component. And therefore the three different parameters are phi star, L star and alpha. This is the parameter of the power law and the other two parameters essentially set some sort of normalization in both the x and the y axis. Because of the form of the Schechter function, then if we integrate the function, we can actually get the total number density of sources or galaxies within some luminosity range. And if we then multiply by a given volume, essentially, for example, the volume of the entire universe, then we can have the total number of sources or galaxies. Now I'll explain why this guy is, is here with his knee this is the actual guy, this is Paul Schechter that actually came up with this, this function to explain galaxy luminosity functions. But for now, let's try to function on the behavior of the function itself and looking at these three different parameters and what they mean in reality. Now, if you plot the Schechter function, it will look pretty much like this. So you can focus on the black line being some sort of reference. If you were to give these parameters, so L star being 10 to the 43 erg per second, and phi star 10 to the minus three megaparsec to the minus three. So this is one over volume essentially. And with a specific power law, in this case, minus 1.4, the Schechter function would look like this. And one of the reasons why Schechter functions are also quite useful is because the parameters can actually be seen very easily in the graph. And essentially L star is the luminosity at which in practice, the function transitions between being a power law and being dominated by an exponential decay. This is what we call the knee. And that's why uh, Paul Schechter is here indicating his knee. This is essentially the typical luminosity or the knee. 
And at the same time, this at the knee luminosity, then we also have the typical number density of sources, which is phi star. So if you read off in the Y scale, the luminosity corresponding to L star, then you can actually read off phi star. In this case, the number density of sources at which the behavior between a power law and an exponential changes and one function becomes dominant over the other. On the other hand, what alpha is doing is essentially setting how steep the power law is. If you make alpha more negative, it will become steeper. And this means that you will have even more faint sources or higher number density of faint sources. And if alpha is decreased, then the function becomes flatter. If you understand these parameters and what they mean for the function, then you can very easily understand that if you change L star by say a factor of 10, all you're doing is transforming black into blue. So you're just shifting the function in L. Phi star will still be the same. On the other hand, if you fix L star and instead change phi star, then all you're doing to the function is just pushing it down. At the same time, if phi star and L star are fixed, but what you're doing is changing alpha, all you're doing is changing the power law and making it steeper but the knee of the function is still going to be in exactly the same position. This cartoon version of Paul Schechter showing his Schechter function really tries to capture some of the behavior. The fact that this part is basically the, the power law that depends on alpha. There's the knee, the exponential part. And the problem sometimes with the Schechter function is that even though it models galaxy luminosity functions very well, it actually hides a lot of the details. Therefore, it doesn't really give us a lot of physical understanding unless we can actually match these parameters to physics. The sector function is used a lot and there's lots of real applications to galaxies. It can be used to fit and model star formation rate functions like what you have here. Essentially, the number density of galaxies as a function of their star formation rate. It is also used in general for luminosity functions, say the luminosity in B band or V band for stellar mass functions, when we look at the number density of galaxies given specific stellar masses, UV luminosity functions, or for example, the luminosity function of Lyman alpha for galaxies that are bright in Lyman alpha. One of the big advantages of the Schechter function is that the integral actually comes out very simply in an analytical form. The integral of a Schechter function is actually given by phi star, L star, and then this term, which is the gamma function, this is not something you'd know, but that you can very easily look up online or in a calculator. And essentially the value you give to the gamma function is alpha plus two. And essentially, if you multiply the value of the gamma function with alpha plus two in these parameters, you can actually get, for example, the number of galaxies in the universe or the number density, or for example, the star formation rate density of the universe. And we'll come back to this in section 14, where I'll explain this even further.